Okay, let's pray. Father, may your spirit be with us. Open our hearts, open our ears, open our mind. Let us receive your teachings. And may all the words from my mouth are all from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. My daughter, Beatrix, is going to be 17. And my son, Phineas, is turning 11 this year. So there's a six-year gap between them. I still remember when they were babies. They need milk every three to four hours. This means one of their feedings was in the midnight. And because I, I got used to going to bed very late, even for now, I, I took the light shift for the midnight feedings. And my wife Vivian took the early morning feedings. So that is, I usually, I, mean, I, I usually, I went to bed at around 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. And Vivian would wake up at around 5 o'clock or something. <laughs> So when Beatrix was around four to five, Vivian suggested, let's have a second child. And I was so scared. I refused at the beginning because I really didn't want to go through the tough baby and toddler stages again. <laughs> However, Vivian thought it would be good for, for Beatrice to have a sibling. So I surrendered. And we had our son. Yes. That part time. We started again and last for, for years. It's true that all parents have to sacrifice for their children. The early stage was really, really tough. But they did bring us a lot of joy. In John chapter 12, the story happens during the Passover festival. Passover is a time when the Jewish people remember how God spared their ancestors during the last of the plagues in Egypt. They reflect on God's past deliverance and also eagerly anticipate his future salvation. Today's passage begins with Greece coming to worship and finding Philip. It's fascinating because Passover is a Jewish festival Yet, Greeks are interested in it. So here, Greeks doesn't just mean people from Greece, but refers to all non-Jewish people, also known as Gentiles from a Jewish viewpoint. These Greeks are probably not converse to Judaism. They are often referred to as God-fearers because they admire the Jewish faith and respect its traditions. Philip is unique among Jesus' disciples because he has a Greek name and is from Bethsaida, a town where both Jews and Gentiles live. Philip likely has an easier time communicating with these Greeks because of his background and familiarity with Greek culture. 
this uncertain if these Greeks eventually meet Jesus. Nevertheless, their arrival prompts Jesus to declare, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Indicating that his death is forthcoming. In John's Gospel, the hour symbolizes the timing of Jesus' death, which is solely determined by God. With this declaration, Jesus acknowledges that the moment Peter has arrived, and as he approaches his crucifixion, this theme of timing resounds throughout the narrative. Jesus further elaborates by saying, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. His parables often draw from agricultural imagery, teaching us about the Christian community and emphasizing how our relationship should reflect the life of the Trinity. However, when we examine our own tendencies towards individualism and violence, we may struggle to grasp the significance of Jesus' words and view them as overly idealistic. Today's passage highlights this confusion as it portrays the delicate and abuse of Jesus' innocence. This paradox challenges us because we don't naturally conceive of God being susceptible to abuse. Verse 27 presents a Jedi portrayal of Jesus' prayer at Gethsemane, as described in Synoptic Gospels. Here, Jesus expresses the turmoil of his soul, describing it as troubled. The English translation may not fully convey the intensity of the Greek verb used to express Jesus' profound emotion. This same word is employed to describe Jesus' reaction upon seeing the sorrow of those mourning Lazarus' death. Jesus doesn't request to be spared, but instead asks to glorify the Father's name through his death. Because the Father and the Son are one, both are glorified as Jesus' death becomes the means of God's salvation. God will raise Jesus and vindicate him, leading the world to recognize and honor God by accepting this redemptive offering. Full one death, many believers receive life. This is the essence of the agriculture of the agricultural metaphor Jesus employs in John 12, 24. Theologian and pastor Eugene Peterson suggests that we all experience periods of forced imprisonment in our lives. These are times of significant loss, such as unemployment, divorce, or grief which feel like exile, compelling us to leave behind our familiar surroundings for unfamiliar territory. With these circumstances, themselves don't inherently bring about new life and goodness. It's remarkable how they can create the conditions necessary for growth and renewal. There's an old saying that God never gives us more than we can handle. 
while many people feel overwhelmed by the burden lives imposed on them. It's fascinating how often these burdens transform into opportunities for us to witness the power of God in fresh and new ways. Some time ago, I met my friend from theological college, who is now an ordained minister. A few months back, he was assigned to serve another congregation. However, when he first led a Sunday service there, only seven people showed up, which left him feeling uncertain about what he could offer to, to that church. He found himself struggling with doubts, similar to Jesus asking God if he could avoid his fate. Despite his initial hesitations, he realized he couldn't escape the challenge and decided to confront it head on, pondering how he could make a difference for that congregation. Though he didn't share the specifics of his essence with me, it's remarkable that after three months, the Sunday service attendance has grown up to around 30 people, from 7 to 30. This serves as a testament to perseverance and faith. To the Linfield congregation, This experience is a reminder. Never give up hope. Even in the toughest time, the church is awaiting its moment. Beyond that hour, it will experience renewal and growth. Jesus teaches us that life emerges from death. When a seed falls to the ground and dies, it can then grow and produce life. This imagery of the grain dying mirrors Jesus' own impending death and introduces the only embedded in the plan of salvation. While death may seem like an end, it actually leads to new life. This paradox lies at the core of our faith, the mystery that through the lens of the cross, what appears bad is ultimately good. During his time on earth, Jesus offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And his prayers were heard. Despite being the son, he learned obedience through his suffering. Jesus often sought solitude in the wilderness to be alone with God. Even at the beginning of his ministry, these wilderness experiences can lead to personal growth. So, when you find yourself in a wilderness experience, whether physically or emotionally alone, perhaps feeling fearful or in pain, remember Jesus' example. Ask God to guide you through this challenging time, turning it into an opportunity for spiritual growth and deepening your relationship with God. Jesus endured suffering, and so must we. Being the Son of God didn't shield him from pain, but 
it revealed a transformative way to endure suffering. Amen.